This is the Real Change Women's and Podcast, Episode 18, Overview of Clinton County Community Action. Our guests today, Jane Newkirk and Teresa Borden. I tell our teachers all the time, it's the most fun job you can have. It's also the most exhausting because it's extremely demanding. You have to leave all of your personal burdens at the door when you walk in because you have got a room full of little people that are counting on you to be your best every single day. And that's what we owe them our best every single day. What is going on, everybody? This is your host of the Real Change Women's and Podcast, Dustin Pierce. And I'm the co-host, Emily Spencer. Emily Spencer. So today we have a, a good episode. We're just going to overview the Clinton County Community Action, all their services that they offer for kids and seniors and everything in between. They do a lot of stuff. So it was cool that Jane and Teresa agreed to sit down with us today and chat. So before we get into that, we're just going to catch you guys up on what's been going on for Real Change. And by Real Change, I mean our lives, I guess. <laughs> so, Emily, what's new now that you're a local celebrity? Well, you know, people will notice me at Kroger. People will notice me at the Board of Elections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people. Uh, so I went to the Board of Election and got my photo taken with the people just to promote, you know, voting early. And the next day, Emily went to vote and the ladies were like, or the lady was like, are you here to get a picture with me, too? <laughs> and we signed an autograph at the Board of Elections. Which is funny, because out of the two of us, I'd say you're very much more the outgoing one. People ask me for things, and I'm like, um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Dustin, who's that girl that follows you around all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm part of your biggest fan club. I was OG. Yeah, you were a fan back when I was just a... a the billboard guy. The billboard. That was before that. Yeah, before that book. Even Make Shark was like a, a barren room. They thought you'd be trafficked out of. Trafficked out of. Yeah. <laughs> so our last episode was with the school board, mm -hmm. and at that time in my life, I was dealing with some blueberry issues. So I'm gonna follow up. Let people know that the blueberries are doing good now, and the solution was to not buy blueberries at Lowe's and instead go to an actual garden center where the the bushes are like ready to go. So yeah, that's how I fixed the problem. Just got better blueberry bushes. Blueberry bushes, better blueberry bushes. Say it like 55. Better blueberry bushes. <laughs> that's the whole episode. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, what was going on in your life at that point, Emily? I don't even remember yesterday. <laughs> well, you did have a fun trip to the Amish country last weekend. Yeah. Um, no, my, my family listens to these. And the last time I saw all of them, they were like, quit talking about us on the podcast. <laughs> so guess what? I'm going to do it some more. <laughs> um, it was my brother's birthday. And we were originally supposed to go to MacArthur and go to the Moonville Tunnel. But then he saw a video on there and thought he was going to get got. So <laughs> we decided to go to chill a coffee and stop at the Amish on the way. But unfortunately, the Amish was packed. So we just kind of did a little scenic drive by and went to chill coffee instead. Nice. So what were some standouts from our talks with Community Action, Emily? Um, I was really interested in the fact that now that COVID is kind of the hype around it is dying down and people are feeling better and treatments are out there and stuff, and the world is opening up, that they want to re-involve the seniors in community. And that's not just in local community. They purchased a bus recently, I believe was what Jane said, and they've been taking them to Cincinnati for dinner and to the museums. And I just think all of that's great because if I was a senior, I would not want to be stuck in Clinton County all the time. Yeah. And I guess things like that helps with their memory and just their happiness and joy getting out and doing things besides just sitting at their house all day. So it's really cool. What stood out for you? Uh, well, Jane talked about some of the activities that the seniors get to do that include chair volleyball. And I cannot wait to get old now to play some chair volleyball. That's it. <laughs> Your motivation. Yeah. Kicking butt at chair volleyball. Exactly. I mean, she did say that their lunchroom is like open for the community. Mm -hmm. So maybe their chair volleyball team is just open as well. I can just go join a team. Yeah, just walk in there and be like, we're a sign up set. <laughs> Have your visor on and your, and your deck shorts on as well. Yeah, I can disguise myself as an old man. <laughs> I already have uh -huh. a grumpy attitude, yeah. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in Jane and Teresa and get this episode started. Jane and Teresa, welcome to the Real Change Wilmington podcast. Thank you for having us. So we're going to chat today about the Clinton County Community, community action. action. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My brain is like fried this morning. <laughs> we have back-to-back -back meetings. Um, but anyways, so before we jump into that, Jane, can you give us some background about who you are, 
your history in Wilmington and how you became the director of Community Action. Um, I've been with Community Action. It'll be 35 years in August. I um, did not grow up in Wilmington, but I've been here for about 38 years. I started out working for the JTPA program at Community Action and um, helping people find jobs, placing them in job placement. And I moved into my current position of CEO in 2020. Okay. What brought you to Wilmington? Um, I had a brother that lived here, and I grew up in a small town in Jackson County. Wasn't a whole lot there to do, so I moved here and met my husband, so I stayed. Very cool. What's your husband do? He is a co-manager for Kroger. Awesome. Do you have any hobbies? Not really a lot of hobbies. I enjoy spending time with my husband and my dog. Um, I'm involved in choir at my church, so that is um, a lot of my time. Just is the kind of things I like to do. I like to get out and take walks. Yeah. Now's the time of year to do that. Yeah. Very cool. Teresa, tell us about yourself. How did you get to Wilmington? Well, I went to college in Wilmington a long time ago, probably before either of you were born. Um, I graduated with my BA in 1991. When I got married, I lived here for a little while, but I'm originally from Washington Courthouse. Currently, I live in Sabina with my husband. My, my kids are all grown up and moved out now, so I've been a lot of time still with my family and my pets. I have four cats and two dogs that I enjoy a great deal. They take up a lot of my time. And I like to paint and play games with my family, spend time outside with my extended family. And then I came to, I came to camp about a year ago, a little over a year ago. I came here from um, the assistant director's position in Fayette County Head Start. Okay. So same company or just different? It, that was also community action, yes. Okay. Each community action is independent, but I worked at community action in Fayette County. Okay. So Jane, can you give us a history about community action in general? Like what is the organization and how does it come to a community? What does it do in a community? Community actions were started, um, Lyndon B. Johnson, War on Poverty, 1964-1965. So we've been around since 1965. Our goal is to work with people, not necessarily, we probably will never alleviate poverty, poverty, but we work with people to try and get them out of their circumstances to make their lives better. We can help with anything from utilities, um, shut off notices if people need wood, if they need propane. Um, we can weatherize people's homes. We help with food. We have housing projects where we can provide homes for people, uh, apartments for them to live. We operate the senior center where we do things for seniors, mills, transportation, um, help them fill out paperwork. We have the Head Start program and we have child care facilities. We've just done a variety of things just to try and people help people that fall in those gaps that they're not able to be self-sustaining on their own. And how did it start in Wilmington? That, I'm not sure exactly how it started in Wilmington. Every county pretty much has a community action agency, so they just started up. I'm not sure how, exactly how Clinton County's got started, but I think that was just an, an initiative back in 1965 okay. to get it going. Okay. And then how are you guys funded? We receive uh, federal, state, and lo some local funding, but it's mostly federal and state funds that we have. Each program has their own separate funding, but it's all either state or federal. And is that something that your organization here in Clinton County has to like get those grants, or is that like the parent company that gets the grants for you? How yeah. does that work? We apply for the grants. Each program has a grant. Um, each program has a grant cycle. So them from them are based on um, the calendar year. Our fiscal year is July 1 through June 30. So some of them are July 1 through June. They each have a, their own fiscal year. We have to apply each year for a grant, submit a budget for all of our programs because they're all each individual. Okay. Is that your job or? No. Okay. That is, we have fiscal department. Yeah. They do it and then the program directors. Okay. Nice. That's and a lot of work. Them. Okay. Yeah. So you do a lot of stuff. Do you want to start with the child care and then work our way back up to the seniors? Yeah. All right, so Teresa, tell us about the child care program. Well, we have a couple of different programs, actually. We run a Head Start program. Our Head Start program is an original grantee from 1965. Like Jane said, that started with um, under President Johnson and the War on Poverty. Um, that's how Head Start got its name. Research showed that children of 
at-risk children in poverty started their lives at a significant deficit compared to their middle and upper class peers. So Head Start started as programming to give preschoolers a head start in um, school readiness. Our primary goal is still school readiness through Head Start. We understand that helping children be prepared to succeed in school and in life can only happen if you work with the entire family. So in Head Start, we actually have a, a social services component where we work very closely with our families. We ask them to dream what their perfect family would look like, what that life would look like for themselves, and then what's stopping them from achieving that. And then we help them set actionable, achievable steps that they can follow to meet specific goals that they decide on to better their own circumstances. Um, we work with our children to prepare them for kindergarten and on through the future. Uh, all of our teachers have a minimum of an associate's degree or higher. We use a research-based curriculum, both for academics and for um, social-emotional. A lot of children today are in trauma, and this is particularly true of kids that come from at-risk environments. So that social emotional supplement curriculum is very important. Teachers write weekly individualized lesson plans that work for the whole classroom and for each child in the classroom. And our curriculum covers all areas, physical, social, emotional, cognitive, science, math, language, literacy, and creative arts. And we serve 85 children in that program. That program is full with a waiting list. Um, and if you're interested in applying for that program, we think that you might qualify for that program because that's an income-based program. Okay. Then I do have a, a contact for that where you would call Community Action and ask for Dorothy Campbell. She heads up our enrollment department and she would take it from there. And it, as a part of the Head Start component, some of the things that we offer families, so we do a lot of parent engagement activities in the evenings. Um, we have a group for fathers, grandpas, uncles called MAD, mm -hmm. which stands for Males Making a Difference. And the men come in once a month with their children and do specific um, activities oriented around dads and uncles and grandpas and, and their significant child. Um, we have a kinship I think I saw support. in the paper that there was like a, a graduating class of dads or something in their kids recently. Oh, we did. We had. It wasn't a graduation, but yes, we we recently had our most recent activity with the male. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Which probably in the paper. Yeah, we try to put that in every month. That's awesome. So this past month, we actually had an art um, auction that was open to the whole community. Um, you could see it in person at the senior center, or you could um, go on Facebook and, and bid on those pieces. And our males and their kids made a lot of, of those pieces that were in the auction. We offer a kinship support group. We have a lot of children that are being raised by folks who are not their biological parents. So we have a support group for kinship family members that are raising children that are not biologically theirs. That's a need, a significant need in this county, and that's also very well attended. Additionally, Head Start believes that it's important that their parents be involved in the governance of the program. So we have something called Policy Council, that's where um, parents at their monthly parent meetings, they elect individuals to serve on the policy council that meets once a month. And that is there to help provide guidance for the daily operations of Head Start. So policy council approves all of the policies and procedures that are put in place. They're made aware of any hirings, terminations. They help us make decisions about where they think the program needs to go, how they want to see it evolve. Um, so there's a great chance for growth and opportunity for our parents um, to participate in the actual governance of our program. So that's different than like the... I guess a nonprofit organization. We are a nonprofit. And that's different than the nonprofit board, then. That yes, okay. we also have our board of trustees, which mm -hmm. is our gover governing board. Now we do have a member of our policy council then would serve on the governing board. Okay. So they would act then as that liaison between the two boards yeah. to communicate. The community action is required to have a tripart board, which is that's just a standard thing for community action agencies. You have to have a tripart board where you have. So many low income, so many um, public, and so many private reps on your board. Hmm. Okay. 
And then the thing you talked about, the, the policy, policy committee, council. is that kind of like the your version of a school board? Yeah, that's a good way to, yes. That's, okay. That's a, uh, uh, a very a good comparison there. Yes, parents, we do have community members on our policy council um, that are stakeholders um, in our agency. For example, um, we have a representative from the County Board of DD on our policy council as we serve some of common children that would be on IEPs. So, but mostly it is a, is a parent board, yes. Okay. IEP is a... I'm sorry, that means. Individual Education Plan. Okay, I thought I meant that, yes. but I was just making sure. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Head Start is for lower income families, mm-hmm. and then you do more than just Head Start then, right? We do. We also have two private child care centers that take both private pay and state subsidy vouchers. Okay. Our one center is on Alex Drive by the post office. That is our birth to three center. It was uh, child care previously, but a community action went in and did a lot of really nice renovations and, and changes there. It's a very nice building. Okay. So that's our that's our zero to three building. And all of our, we believe in the highest quality program for our kids. So all of our child cares are run with the same standards as a Head Start. So all of our teachers there have to get a minimum of what's called their CDA, since for Child Development Associate. Um, which is a little step below your associate's degree. We have several staff working on their associate's degree. We use a research-based curriculum and also a social-emotional curriculum. The state of Ohio changed the rules around child care a few years ago because they recognized that kids spend more and more time in care, um, more care during more time in care during the week, usually than with their parents or caregivers. And they also recognize that science tells us that your brain develops faster between zero and five than at any other time in your life. So you are setting the tone for who a person is going to be by the time they're five. And what I mean by that is you're, we are teaching them the basis for critical thinking, problem solving, all that stuff. The foundation for that is laid zero to five. So that's why we have a, a curriculum even for our youngest little people, because it's very important that they have facilitated interactions with their teachers that help encourage that creativity and that imagination and that problem solving. So it lays the basis for that. So, yes, we have openings in that center currently for zero to three. We just finished opening the last couple of rooms. So what, what age group is considered preschool? That's our other center. We have a private preschool also. That's three to five. Okay. So below that is like a daycare? Is that what's considered or no? It is, yes. It is a, okay. a full day child care. Daycare in the effect that it's open almost 12 hours a day. Our hours at the two private child care centers are 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then your preschool center is like a classroom like setting. It's is, is it, how, how is it different than the daycare? I'm just I don't know about child care. No, you're fine. Yeah. They are both actually daycares because daycare really re- is a term that relates to how long a center is open. Okay. So daycare is really about ensuring that a center is open long enough for parents to work a full shift, hmm. drop their child off, pick their child up after work. That's why we're open all 11 and a half hours a day. So for both centers the birth to three center and our preschool center, which is on Clinton street across from the football field. Both of those centers, it's the same thing. All the teachers have to have a minimum of their CDA or higher. Um, we also have several staff there enrolled in their associates degree program. We use curriculums. They have to plan lessons at all three of our sites, whether it's Head Start or the, the daycare, we provide breakfast, lunch, and snack. So we cook um, for the kids to make sure they're getting healthy meals and plenty of food for the day. We don't want anybody going hungry. We have really nice playgrounds, outdoor and burst motor activities, really important. And again, at the private preschool center, we also take private pay and state vouchers. Okay. So, and then all of the rooms are organized. They're all classroom based. So, but when you, when I say classroom, don't think about desks and dittos and that's not what early childhood classrooms look like. We have different centers for exploration. We have an art center, a science center, a sensory center, different places for our kids to play and learn and grow and build and 
be creative, use their imaginations. So you mentioned the hours for your daycare centers. What's the hours for Head Start or is it the same? No, Head Start's nine to four, Monday through Thursday. Now is is uh is community action the like I'm sure it's the, the largest daycare center in Wilmington. Is it the only daycare center in Wilmington? Besides like your mom and like your moms or dads that stay home and do private care? The licensed. Yeah, center. yeah. Yes. The the public schools have preschools also, but they're not full day, so they're not a, they're not oriented toward child care. They're okay. they're there to provide a specific smaller preschool program. Um, we are the only infant toddler center in the county. Okay. So you said that there was a child care center, was it at the building by the post office before and you took it over? Mm-hmm. What what happened to that group or what, what was it? Um, that was Wilmington Learning Center, I believe is what it was called, that right, Jane? Honestly, the owner, the owner there, wonderful lady, um, funnily enough, she was my first boss in early um, education back in the 90s. Um, she just retired. Okay. So... Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And there's there is some talk about uh, I don't know what group it's what's a group at uh the company at the airport. I don't know if you guys are part of that or not. I think you guys are part of that. The, the workforce, workforce collaborative. Yeah, so there is a lot of like I don't know, complaining, not complaining, but like there's an issue with childcare in the community. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what the issues are and how your organization is addressing them in your ways? Um, we are we are working on that, and that's part of why Community Action decided to open the two private child cares. They saw a need in the community and decided that that's what we're there to do, is to work toward meeting community need. So the idea was to open the child cares to help meet that need. A large part of what happened with child care in the community was kind of twofold. Part of it was the, the state of Ohio has a quality improvement system called Step Up to Quality, those rules that you have to follow there, um, it's a five-star rating system, and the more stars you have, the more money that you get paid from the state of Ohio to run your system, or your center, I'm sorry. Those rules are are very detailed. There, there's a lot to that, and it ran a lot of child care out of business. Um, they're not bad rules. I'm not at all saying that I actually advocate for that system because it is it does exactly what it's designed to. It ensures quality for the kids. Mm-hmm. It ensures that the kids just aren't sitting or being in staff or just existing with the children. It ensures quality interactions. Again, it's based in the research that tells us how fast the brain develops zero to five. Now, they have gone back and revised those standards a little bit to make it a little easier for licensed in-home providers, which I do think is a good thing. I'm not sure that it's reasonable to ask someone who runs an in-home mm-hmm. child care center to say, hey, you've got to go back to school. I'm not sure that's a reasonable expectation and, and works for someone physically. There's a lot of like requirements for their house like set up too, right? Yeah. So. Yes, a lot of it as well. A lot of yes. Yeah. Playground has to meet all of the same um, requirements as as a commercial center. So. Yeah, I would imagine running a childcare business is a lot of work, <laughs> like mm-hmm. regulation wise, and also like taxing uh, the job itself. So. There are a lot of rules to follow. We follow Head Start performance standards as well as the state of Ohio early learning development standards. And then of course we follow the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services rules. So we have three sets of rules that we have to comply with at any given moment. Yeah, how do you work with the jobs and family service? Because they offer some of those same like family services that you talked about, I think too, right? Uh, like so far as like working with families on like counseling issues and stuff like that or helping them. Job and family services, I'm not sure what they offer in the way of Counseling, uh, I'm really not honestly okay. 100% sure. Yeah. I think they just partner with solutions. Oh, okay. I know they offer a lot of the financial assistance and cash assistance, food stamps, and vouchers for child care, things like that to help support families. So they're the ones that provide the vouchers that you would take yes. for your private care mm-hmm. programs? Correct. Okay. So anything else? Um, I encourage anyone that needs child care to give us a call <laughs> and... Come out and see our centers. Um, we've done a lot of work there. They've been they we've been renovating. They look really great, and we have a lot of really great staff. And it's a, it's a really happy place to be. It's I tell our teachers all the time. It's 
the most fun job you can have. It's also the most exhausting because it's extremely demanding. You have to leave all of your personal burdens at the door when you walk in because you have got a room full of little people that are counting on you to be your best every single day. And that's what we owe them our best every single day. But where else do you get paid to be silly and play and nothing nothing brings down your blood pressure like singing with a preschooler or rocking a baby or experimenting in Play-Doh with a toddler. I mean, it's just, it's a happy place to be. Yeah. Our facilities are nice. They're and very nice. We're getting ready to have, the, we call it Sips at Parade, an HR event, the 27th? 27th. At 5.30 at our Aging Up Center on Nelson Avenue for HR people from all the businesses in town so that we can give them tours so that they can see what's available in child care services for their employees. Okay. So how would that work? So would a company be able to partner with you? Mm-hmm. Yes. Can you talk about that then? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, that's our goal is for um, companies to hopefully partner with us and to buy into the fact that child care is needed in the community and getting them to buy in to help, you know, support that endeavor. Child care is not a moneymaker. The need is there, but it's the resources for the child care. And then you're trying to build that future workforce. These children are going to be the eventual workforce of Clinton County. So we want to partner with some of the companies and in the community. So we thought we would try this event. And... So would that partnership mean that you provide the child care at the organization or they just have an agreement with you to have their employees use your facilities? Correct, to use our facilities, yes. yeah. And then the company would pay you for that? Yeah, we're going to have several opportunities available for them. Okay. We've created a nice binder that we'll present to them. There's different levels that they could that they could do. We could, you know, if they wanted to reserve spaces for so many of their employees, there's just different options that they could choose from. Is this something that's already in place or something you're working on to launch soon? We're going to be launching it that night at that event. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, we talked to a company in town and they explored the idea of offering childcare at their facility. But when they looked into it, they said that the insurance was like way too expensive, and they, which is surprising because they're, they're a, lar- a very large company that they wouldn't take that on. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very costly. Yeah. yeah, yes. yeah. Our board just felt like, then, like Teresa said, that the need was in the community at the time. It was, you know, right after COVID, all the daycares were gone, but the need was there for these children. Sorry. Could is it. the age range for that program the same as your? Uh, child, your current child care facilities? Because mm-hmm. I know, I don't think you guys offer a school not. age no. No. or after school program. We tried and that just didn't work out. Yeah. yeah, there was some hubbub in the community, I think, beginning of this school year about, did you guys have a, a certain age group that you stopped doing or something? Mm-hmm. Can you maybe talk about what that was and why you decided to stop doing that? School age is a very, unless you're a private provider for school age, that is a very hard age group to provide quality care for and break even. The bottom line was we were losing a lot of money attempting to provide school age care. Um, the rate that you receive for school age is very small um, and you are licensed. We had uh, one classroom for our school age that is probably the size it wasn't a gigantic room it was licensed for 38 children that's a lot of children in addition school age is kindergarten through sixth grade oh wow yeah that's a huge age span to try to put all in one room and that was just something that we found that we just couldn't keep that room staffed we it was just overwhelming the number of kids and yet the little bit of income that came in that wasn't able to provide all the necessary materials and things that they would have liked to have tried to do. It was just too costly to continue to upkeep. Does Wilmington have a option for those students right now besides just the private individuals that could watch those kids after school? Not that I'm aware of. I know that in the past that and I'm not sure which ones, but I know some of the school districts in the county have attempted that. Uh-huh. I don't believe they do that anymore, but I don't have children in the system, so I'm not exactly sure. I wouldn't be the expert to ask on that one. <laughs> Is that something you'd ever consider bringing back, or are you guys just, uh, for lack of better, just uh, happy with how you keep things now with birth to five? Is that it? 
it's worth the five right now. I wouldn't say that's totally out of the picture, but right now, there's not that space. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't exist um, anymore as we expanded the birth to three to make that whole center because there is a huge need for infant toddler care. Because like I said, we are the only infant toddler center in the entire county. And as you can imagine, having zero to three, um, having babies, that ratio is a lot smaller. The adult to child ratio is a lot smaller. So we took that space and converted it and solved infant toddler space at this time. Eventually, could I see us maybe expanding to offering some kind of after school something? Maybe, but that, that would depend on finances and uh, finding appropriate space. There's a lot to running a child care just with your physical space. There's a lot that you have to, uh, standards that you have to meet. We recently interviewed the CCYC, the Clinton County Youth Council, mm -hmm. and I don't think they go as, they definitely don't go as low as your age group. I think it's maybe high schoolers and middle schoolers. Yes. But they were also just lamenting about the need for programs for students mm -hmm. um, since the YMCA is no longer here and, and stuff. And there's no like youth center in town. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's transition to the other services that you guys offer. <laughs> we say we help from birth till they're no longer here. <laughs> that's, that's well, you know, because we have people way up in their years that come to the senior center. So um, our senior center is for. You can be a member 55 or over, so we qualify. Mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. and uh, But we, they do activities. They have daily activities. They can come in and play. There's all kinds of um, games. They have. They play Mexican train dominoes. They play chair volleyball, ping pong. I don't know how many different kinds of card games they play. Is it chair volleyball? Chair volleyball. Yeah, they sit in chairs, and it's very competitive. So they <laughs> sit. They, it is very, we, we as a, as a um, staff, we played with them one day, and they will call you out if you're bottom raises up off that seat they call you that's you're not allowed to do that you have to stay in the seat yeah they sit in their chairs and play the volleyball that's amazing. they love that they okay. do cornhole and they have uh, the center is open from 8 to 3 30 monday through friday and the center is on nelson right on nelson avenue yeah. okay so we changed the name a few years ago because it's the aging up center but we still call it the senior center just trying to make it more age friendly but for lunch we have title three funds so if you're 60 and over it's just a donation. We can't charge. We say ask for a donation of five dollars. If they can afford to pay it, they pay. If they don't, they don't. If you know whatever they can contribute, um, anybody under that can still come. They just have to pay the full price for that lunch. We just started cooking our meals in house last week because they were complaining about the meals that we were getting in from our vendor. So that seems to have gone over well. They um, so we, anybody could come and get lunch there. Uh -huh. I could yeah. come in and get lunch. Yeah, you can come get lunch. They try to whatever. They try to have you um, schedule like two days before so he knows oh, okay. how much to make. Sure. And we've been trying to put out on Facebook our menus, what he's having each each day. And then we do transportation. Transportation is for sixty and over. We can take them anywhere in the county. And once again, that's just a suggested donation. We can't make them pay. If they make a donation, they do. If they don't, they don't. We still take them. Just last year. Because of COVID, the only thing good that came out of COVID for us was we were able to get some funds to do some things that we would not have been able to do. So we have our first ever bus for the seniors. So they love to go places. We um, have taken them on shopping trips. We're taking them to Bainbridge to the Amish store this month. They went to um, the conservatory. So they're getting to go outside of Bloomington. It's even something as simple as going out to dinner. They've taken a couple of dinner trips and socialization so that's really important for them mentally to keep them going if um, they stay in their homes all the time they're just going to they're going to age faster they're going to lose some of their memory and it's just better for them to get out so the senior center offers you know all of those things for them just trying to do different activities trying to build it up we have to do fundraisers because the title three money that we get we have to have a local match we don't get any local funds so we have to raise this match money. So last year we had a fashion show with a local vendor in town, and it went over really well. That was good. We He does catering and things just to try and make some money for the seniors. We have, um, I think this is going to be our 10th annual 5K that we have, same time as the corn festival is going on. So we'll have that again. Um, the seniors, we get them involved. They um, help us put our backs together and try to keep them active and involved and um, they sell pressed chicken sandwiches at the Corn Festival, so the seniors pull the chicken and they work the booth. Just things to try and keep the center going. 
We're in the process of, we obtained another grant, we're building an exercise ring line to the senior center. So that would be a nice adventure for them to keep them mobile um, with treadmills and bikes and things just to get them out and about. But we work with seniors, um, supportive services to do things like, it's very, even for someone my age, filling out paperwork for eligibility for things, for your insurance and stuff is confusing. And we do that for seniors. We have someone that does that for them. Um, we do some house cleaning for, for people. Those are a, a lot of the things that we do with the senior center. And in June, we'll have our senior awareness fair where a lot of organization and businesses come in. The seniors come and, and they're, they're always giving out things and giving presentations about their businesses. So we try to do things to keep them, to keep them active. So the row of houses, right? Is your... We have housing. We have um, a total of 262 units. We have six properties. Four are senior housing and two are family housing. But yeah, we have a property off of Nelson. Mm -hmm. We have one off of Jeannie Wilson Way, one off of Commons Lane. And then we have one off of 730 in Blanchester. Those are all seniors. And then off of Howard and Vine, we have two family properties back in there. Okay. That's a lot. Yeah. And there's actually like a, like a, a center that they go to also? No, the two of our senior properties have a community room okay. that they can you go and use for themselves. It's not staffed or anything. It's just available if they want to have family events or little community get-togethers. Okay. Yeah. And you said, I think you said this, but COVID um, impacted the events that you guys could do. Now you're getting those back going well, again. Getting those back open. We were closed. So our senior center had been there like 20 years, and we hadn't done anything to it. And when COVID hit... We thought we were going to be closed for three weeks. So it's like, okay, let's fix up the senior center. Let's do some painting. And and we used some of our 5K fundraising money and just did some upgrades at the senior center. A year later, when we were allowed to open, um, the seniors getting them back in, it's just been kind of slow getting them back in. Some people are still afraid to be around people and, and they're still cautious. But we're slowly getting them to come back out and, and getting them back in because we weren't we couldn't do any activities. So now we've started having those game events. We'll have a Saturday where we'll have a game event where they can come in and play games and and just, you know, socialize with each other or take these trips where we can go out to dinner or shopping trips and stuff. Okay. So how many how many senior centers are there in Wilmington? There's there's also Cape May and there's you guys. Right. Cape May, they, that's a senior living facility. Okay. Yeah. So that's a senior living facility. So people live there and that's their community room and building where they, act, they have activities for their people that live in their property. Yeah. How is a living center different than a senior center? They, you don't live at the senior center. So they, it's oh, open. Oh, sure. And yeah, people just come there for activities and lunch. So, yeah. I just meant broadly, like your organization versus like a Cape May, like how many other senior facilities, like housings is there? Um, there is, there's Cape May and then Prairie View mm -hmm. that they have um, a building and I think they might have a community room within that building, but I know that's been under rehab. So I think they might have a facility there. Blanchester has a senior center, just freestanding like our senior center. Okay. And then like our, our senior apartments in Blanchester has a community room for our residents to go and use. There's no mills or anything there. What's a mill? Their lunch. Uh, okay. Oh, meal. Okay. Who like, does it to me, too? I didn't do it on purpose. I just, I thought it was it like a... Be, it might be how I speak, because <laughs> my husband says I have that southern train from where I grew up at, so... Well, there's so many, like, the Buckley Brothers mill. Like, I just thought it was a mill for, like, seniors. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, they can come for lunch. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, so we talked about uh, kiddos, seniors, and you also offer a bunch of things in between, too, yes. right? For, like, for utilities and stuff. Yes. Speak, speak to those things a little bit, too. So, um, during the wintertime, we have what's called winter crisis program, where they can come in and apply if they have a disconnect notice, if they um, have dock fuel like wood, propane, and they need assistance with that. And then we can also help them get signed up for regular HEAP, Home Energy Assistance Program, where they can get an extra credit to come off on their utility bill. And then in the wintertime, our summer um, program, they can, um, if they have, I believe it's different rules, if they have a doctor's statement where they have breathing issues, we can help with their air conditioning. We can provide an air conditioner, or we can help them with their electric bill to run their current air conditioning. There's different income guidelines for all of the programs. And then we have a weatherization program where we can insulate people's homes to make their homes more energy efficient. We can do weather stripping. 
caulking, glass replacement, insulation, and we can even do furnace and water heater replacement. And that's open to homeowners or renters. You don't have to be a homeowner to get that, that service. We have a food pantry. People can come cool, in. Okay. So do you have like repairmen on staff that do that work or do you outsource that or how does that work? We do, we do everything as far as the insulation and the caulking and all that. We do that ourselves. We contract out the furnaces and the water heaters. Okay. And those things that we, we contract out because you have too many rules and guide, guidelines. And that's the only program that we do in Clark County as well. We do weatherization and so each county will have their different rules on how things are done. So it's just easier for us to contract those things out. Where's that house at? It's at our office on Nelson. Okay. Everything's on Nelson Avenue. Okay. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. No, you're fine. Go ahead. You're fine. The food pantry, they can come in um, once a week to get food assistance. We um, we have a community services block grant that pays our overhead expenses for that. The food we purchase, the majority of our food purchased from the um, food bank in Cincinnati because it's so inexpensive. And then we do have to buy some things from the grocery store. But the money that we use for that is um, normally through a United Way grant, which is local funding, or just local donors will donate toward that. We um, have a car repair program where we can help people with car repairs. Hopefully, we'll be getting a, a bigger program on that in the near future. That's hopefully coming down the pike. Did that program change or something? Was it like they used to, you got a car or something, we now it's just repaired? Pre-COVID, uh -huh. we uh, ran a program where we would purchase vehicles. So we would act like the bank, and we would um, the people would purchase the vehicle. We would purchase it. They would get the memorandum title, and then once the title was, car was paid off, they would get the title free and clear. Well, COVID hit, you could not find a used car. And then when you could find a used car, we would have only been able with the funds that we had buy like two cars and the program would have been done. So we had to kind of quit that program because you just can't find used vehicles um, because we had to keep them. They were older cars and higher miles, but it was a start for someone to get them a car into a car to get them back and forth to work. And then once that was paid off, then they had that title free and clear and they could trade up. So the program worked for 20 some years. We started out with a small grant from Job and Family Services, and we only had it for one year. But that revolving loan where people were making their payment back with a little bit of interest, we were able to keep that program running. So we decided after we couldn't get cars anymore, we would just utilize those funds for car repairs. And you do that at Nelson, too? Yes, everything's at Nelson. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So you have like handymen, daycare center workers, and repairmen all at that one yeah. building. Yeah. Okay, that's crazy. I have a little bit of everything. Yeah, <laughs> yikes. When people come to work there, it's like we tell them, you never know what you're going to be doing, which is the truth. You just never know what you're going to be doing. Okay. <laughs> I put a little plug in for one of our programs. Yeah. Through Head Start, we have a program called the Hero Program, and then a program called the Senior Reader Program. So if you, the Hero Program is sort of our version of um, Big Brother, Big Sister for the kids. So um, we have community volunteers that come in and just spend time with the kids and they work out that schedule with our parent family um, engagement coordinator. Um, she works with them and they decide what kind of time they have available and they come in and play and build in blocks and swing kids on the swing and just spend that extra time with them, give them another adult in their life that they can rely on. So if anybody is interested in being here, they can call Dorothy Campbell. We had a very had a very successful year. This was our first year doing that. And um, of our 85 enrolled children, 55 of them had a hero. Nice. So we thought that was, was really nice. And then we offer senior reading, but you don't have to be a senior. It started out for seniors, an opportunity to read. But we had so many people interested that weren't seniors. We just kind of opened that up. And you can come and read to our kids on Mondays and Wednesdays. And we would just schedule that through Dorothy Campbell also. You can come in and said, we provide a book even. Nice. And you can come in and read. The mayor came in and read. He was an extremely popular reader. So that's funny. It's very animated. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, John. <laughs> Right on. Well, thanks for coming in. Um, are there any other like things you want to address on the podcast, the community that they need to know about your organization? Or no, just encourage anybody to come out. And if you want to see what we're all about, just come and visit us. Um, Monday through Friday, eight to four thirty. Anybody sixty and over, come and join the senior center. And when is the HR event again? That is April the twenty seventh, from five to seven, at seven seventeen North Nelson. Awesome. 
Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, that is it for our episode today, folks. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Jane and Teresa and just knowing a little bit more about this organization called Community Action that exists in our neighborhoods and does a lot of things for our community. So if you have any questions for them, please feel free to talk to them directly and you can find their information on their website. Their website is clintoncapcap.org and you can find out more information about them there. Uh, Also, keep in mind that we have our paper out now, so get it while you can. And we'll have our next issue out hopefully in June. So we had our April, May edition and then our June, July issue should come out here in a few weeks. Uh, So there's still papers out over at Kroger, UDF, Calvin, Kairos, and Sam's Meats. We did drop a few off at houses. That's probably not going to be a regular thing. But uh, if you want to get a copy, go to those locations and grab one before they're all gone. With that, I'm Dustin Pierce. And I'm Emily Spencer. Keep it real, Wilmington. Well